This is The Ramsey Show. You can be intentional about your character. You can have money and a career. You are the hero in your story. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the Dollar Car Rental Studios, it's the Ramsey Show, where debt is dumb, cash is king, and the paid-off home mortgage has taken the place of the BMW as the status symbol of choice. I'm Dave Ramsey, your host. Thank you for joining us. Extra special day here at the Ramsey Show in Ramsey headquarters. Our good friends Joshua Milburn and Ryan Nicodemus, known as the Minimalists, are visiting with us. Uh, we love these guys. Uh, we love the work that they do. And it is so akin to teaching you people to live on less than you make, a concept Congress can't grasp. <laughs> so uh, honored to have my friends here in the studio. Guys, thanks for joining us. Hey, we're honored to be here. Thanks for having us. Dave, we love you, brother. You yeah. too, man. So uh, the new doc is out. Less is now on Netflix. And it's a huge hit. Mm. I mean, it's as always with you guys. The only the only thing you had that harmed it was you put me in it, but um, <laughs> and so all the Dave haters now hate the minimalists. It's mandatory to to, to cancel somebody for something. Oh, but, man. but anyway, it's it's fabulous. It's very well produced. I love the scenes. And uh, your artistic touch, as always, standing in front of the brick walls and stuff and the ang- camera angles and the reenactments of when you were working and all that kind of stuff. It's mm-hmm. very well done, guys. Did you have fun on it? Oh, oh man. Like- so much fun. I wish I could say that we had you know something to do with that art piece of it, but really... Our director, Matt Diavella, he is a savant. So, yeah, the, the videography, really, um, I got to give it up to Matt. I got to give credit where credit's due. But, yeah, we had a lot of fun making it, and i um, really glad to see it uh, uh, going across the TV screens all across the world. Yeah, it's gone gone huge. Okay, let's backtrack because there might be someone out there who just emerged from a cave and never heard who the minimalists are. And so we should uh, upgrade uh, their knowledge and ca- catch them up to where the rest of us are. So minimalism and the minimalists. Uh, give, give me the two-minute version sure. of what it is and how you got here. Yeah, so it really started with two events in my life. My mother died, my marriage ended both in the same month. I was 28 years old, sort of at the pinnacle of my corporate career. I was ostensibly successful, had all the trappings of the American dream. But for me, that also meant a lot of debt, a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety, and of course, in our world, a lot of stuff. The average American household has 300,000 items in it. I had all of those things and more. And it's not that there's anything inherently wrong with the things. The problem is that I had so much stuff that I was forsaking the people closest to me. And I realized that all of my priorities were out of whack. I was so focused on so-called success and achievement and stuff, accumulating these things, they weren't making me happy. They weren't doing their job. And I realized I needed to simplify my life. And that's really where this thing called minimalism came in. Minimalism is just the thing that gets us past the things so we can make room for life's most important things, which aren't things at all. That's not to say that Ryan and I are against stuff. The problem is we have so much stuff, it's actually getting in the way of living a meaningful life. Mm. Yeah, I mean, we're like, uh, most of us in America, uh, we're, we're just stuff obese i mean we just have stuff coming out our ears when you move and you have a box i remember this when i was, mo- when I was a kid when we were moving and you have a box that says seldom used kitchen item <laughs> that might be a sign <laughs> that you have too much stuff yeah it sounds like another name for junk drawer to me yeah yeah in the, the ch- kitchen junk drawer right. seldom used kitchen ronco yeah. apparently sold this crap i mean you know i don't know <laughs> but we buy everything in sight oh. and because we're sold Mm. everything in sight. What did you call it in the documentary? Uh, you called it stuffitis, right? Stuffitis, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we unfortunately, uh, we, we look at these things as a shortcut. We look at uh, purchasing the new car, going on the vacation, buying the bigger house. I know for me, when I got into minimalism, it was because I wanted to get my time back. And the reason why I didn't have control of my time is because I had so much debt. And to pay all of those debt payments, I had to work a crazy, uh, crazy job. 60, 70, sometimes 80 hours a week. And every time I got a promotion, I never thought to myself, oh, here's an opportunity for me to pay off debt. It was always an opportunity for me to buy more. more. Yeah. Because I was looking for a shortcut to happiness. I was looking for a shortcut to status, a, a shortcut for um, significance, really, in, in some ways. Well, and our messages have overlapped for uh, probably close to a decade yeah. now uh, where we just say stuff like, you know, 
it's okay to have a nice car. It's just not okay for your nice car to have you. Mm. That's exactly you right. Know? And, you know, it's the same kind of vibe. It's yeah. this whole thing. No, it's, stuff is not evil. But <laughs> when you gorge yourself on stuff, you're you're going to get satiated. You're never satisfied. Yeah. Right. It's, and, called, it's called the hedonic treadmill, right? Yeah. We, we, what we do is we, we get something, and that becomes our new baseline. And so I went from the Toyota to the Lexus. And so when I had a Lexus, I, all of a sudden I needed two Lexuses. Lex I. <laughs> Because they're running herds. Was, <laughs> right. The one was not enough. In, in, in our culture, it's always more, 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 more. We never stop to consider mm. less. And the only way to consider less is to identify what is enough in my life. And it, when, when we identify we have enough things, what are we making room for? Well, we're making room for our values. We're making room for contribution. We're making room for our family and friends, the people in our lives. It's much more about that than it is about... Uh, amassing more things into our ever busy lifestyles mm. so less is more the old maxim is where you came up with less is now yeah because yeah. it's the it's so cool to be now and again when you want to read this is not a thing to say you're spiritually evil if you have stuff no no it's not a thing to say stuff is bad at all no it's not the stuff's fault no it's that we put it on a pedestal right right absolutely yeah i look at uh it, it's easy to do I, I, the advertisements we see every day it's over five thousand advertisements that's a lot of noise it's a lot of uh, things seeping into our subconscious so I mean, the thing like minimalism really helps us kind of uh, sift through all that noise. And what I really like about our documentary Less Is Now is it's really, it's about starting over. It's about someone who is who is stressed out by their stuff, stressed out by debt, who really is looking to make a shift in their life. Uh, we have uh, what we, we're calling them everyday minimalists in this documentary, uh, everyday people who have been have found a way to start over, whether they're single, whether they have families, and they've really been able to make some major changes in their lives to, to live a more meaningful life. It's impossible to sit and watch the thing, the documentary, though, and not just go pause and go, God... There's so much crap in this house. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, just, or you're welcome. I don't know. It's just useless, you know? I mean, it's just useless. Think about this, Dave. We've been using this word a lot lately, essential. Like, what, essential yeah. businesses, essential travel. But now we're a lot of us have been stuck at home for more than we bargained, and all of a sudden we're looking around saying, what is essential in this house? Yeah. And, and I thought I was going to need all these things, especially if I'm spending more time at home, but it turns out I need it less than ever. It's just getting in the way. The documentary is Less Is Now by the Minimal Minimalists. Uh, Ryan Nicodemus, Joshua Milburn are with us, and uh, you guys be sure and check it out on Netflix. We're going to come back and talk a little bit more about this, but this is uh, this idea of minimizing, this idea of simplifying. It's catching on. It's a bit, the, the minimalists have created a huge movement around this, and, and it gives you good pause uh, psychologically to tap the brakes a little bit and just go, okay, what, what matters? What is real? I'm going to be intentional with this life. Spiritually, godliness with contentment is great gain. Just breathe a little bit. Mm. Maybe if Amazon didn't show up at your front porch for a whole week, <gasps> life would go on. I think you'll be all right. Who <laughs> knew? And gosh, I mean, you can, woo, man, I'm telling you. Wow. All right, we'll be back with these guys for one more segment here in just a second. It's The Minimalists on The Ramsey Show. We were drawn to Christian Healthcare Ministries because we both had young families and we wanted to have more children. And we had also just started a real estate company and needed to find healthcare coverage that would meet our needs. We were attracted to CHM because of its low monthly costs and the ability to negotiate medical costs down. Established in 1981 and accredited by the Better Business Bureau, CHM is here to meet the needs of your growing family or small business. Check us out at chministries.org backslash budget. We absolutely believe in it.
Joshua Milburn, Ryan Nicodemus, the minimalists are with me for a half hour, hanging out here with us in Nashville. Been friends with these guys for some time now. Be sure and check out theminimalists.com to uh, check out their podcast, check out their books that are coming out. The new doc came out in January on Netflix, and it is a major hit. Netflix is grinning. It's the second hit with a documentary you've had with them, and so they they love you guys, of course, because you're making them bank. And uh, it's a great, it's a great, it's a great doc. They allowed me to be in it. Several of my friends are in it. People that we know, and uh, so again, we've got so many values uh, that overlap that we've been brothers of another mother for some time, uh, and then have gotten to be friends off the backside of that. Yeah. So 240 billion dollars is spent on advertising today mm. that's a lot of money yeah and when you think just about what is spent on a given item or we think about the power now of amazon or the power of uh facebook marketing or uh the power of the data collection that google has on individuals to custom offer <sighs> you things that you just can't do without because the offer is so dialed in to exactly who you are right yeah i yeah. mean you really if you don't have a lot of intellectual prowess, you are almost powerless to the sway that they put over the top of you in this. It's and so we end, up, we end up with just what we're talking about is the minimalists are about minimizing your life. Not stuff is evil. Not money is evil. Not you're a bad person if you have a nice car. It's not that kind of stuff. This is not Gnosticism. It's minimalism. Right. And, and so, but it is about make your stuff have meaning. And when you've got so much stuff, you've just gorged on it. It's just like all you do is eat candy, mm. and you've got no no nutrition in your life. Your stuff is giving you no nutrients. Yes, there's yeah. no happiness coming from it. The documentary is less is now, and with all this advertising money spent, we've all got to put our guards up uh, because otherwise we just get sucked into this vortex of consumerism, materialism, and, and loss. So easy you guys do. have helped so many people by giving them a guideline, mm -hmm. giving them a rule or a step. So what's the first thing? If you go, yeah, Dave, I agree with what you're saying. I agree with what Joshua and Ryan are saying. Mm -hmm. But So what do I do now? Because I got a house full of crap. <laughs> <laughs> well, we start the film with a question. How might your life be better with less? And the reason we ask that question, it starts with the why to instead of the how to. The how to sort of manifests as soon as you understand the why. And that's what I love what you, with what you do with your work is helping people understand the benefits of getting becoming debt free the same thing is the benefits of simplifying your life understanding the why for some people it's financial freedom sometimes it's getting your time back sometimes it's improving your relationships sometimes just i want less stuff to clean in my house my house is so full of clutter but also realizing that physical clutter is just a physical manifestation of what's going on inside us if you have a bunch of material clutter you have spiritual clutter, mental clutter, emotional clutter, all of this internal clutter. And it starts with the stuff, but as we start decluttering that stuff, we're able to look inward. We also have some rules, like we have 16 rules for living with less on our website. It's a free ebook people can download. And I'll give you a couple of them here. One's the seasonality rule. We also call it the 90-90 rule. If you look at an item in your house and say, have I used this item in the last 90 days? If not, am I going to use it in the next 90 days? If not, I give myself permission to let go. And that covers all seasons. So right now, if I, did I use it in the winter? Nope. Okay. Am I going to use it in the spring? Nope. Am I going to use it in the summer? Nope. All right. Let's get rid of it. Uh, so we hold on to so many items just in case. Another rule we have, the just in case rule. Think about everything. That's a hoarder rule. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's the hoarder excuse for everything. Yeah. I might need this later. Yeah. In some yeah. hypothetical future that doesn't actually exist. And so... <laughs> <laughs> Anything that we're holding on to just in case, we can let go of because we can replace it for less than $20 in less than 20 minutes. Think about this, though. You never have to use the rule. Once you get rid of it, you don't miss the thing, and you're able to move on as soon as you let go. It's really cheap insurance, and it's definitely cheaper than you know renting out a storage unit every single month to keep all that just-in-case stuff. That, that adds up for sure. Yes, yeah. indeed. Yeah. The just-in-case surcharge. Oh, wow. <laughs> Here's yeah. one more it's for you. It's a tax on just in case. Yeah. Uh, spontaneous combustion rule. So if you have an item that's feeling a little bit burdensome and you, you're struggling, I put so much meaning in it. Of course, if everything's precious, not, nothing is precious, right? Mm -hmm. But if I'm putting so much meaning in this, but ask yourself, how would I feel if this item spontaneously combusted right now? How would that make me feel? And if you'd feel a sense of relief, maybe it's time to let go. Yeah. Mm. 
Yeah. yeah. You does know, it does not mean you can burn your house down. No. Yeah, okay. No, no. <laughs> another good place to start. Um, I think you mentioned uh, your daughter, Rachel, had, had uh, played this game, but the 30 day minimalism game or the hashtag less is now challenge. Mm-hmm. It's a great, great way to start because uh, it helps you get that momentum that you need uh, in order to start to decluttering your life. So the way it works is you find a friend or a family member who wants to get rid of some stuff. And, and we know that decluttering can be a little bit boring, a little tedious. So this makes it fun because you bring someone else in and then you make a bet to see who can go uh, the longest each day of the month uh, getting rid of items. So you start on day one, you get rid of one item. Then you go to day two, you get rid of two items. And then day three, three items. And then, day, okay, so forth and so on. You, you probably get it. Uh, whoever lasts the longest wins. If both people last the whole month, they both win because they would have gotten rid of about 500 items each, which is a great start. Yeah, that's a lot of junk. It is. Yeah, but it can, and, uh, you know, watching the documentary, it was just like a thing of, you know, scotch tape. Right? Mm-hmm. That's one thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or what? I mean, it doesn't have to be like you, yeah. you, you sold your car. Right. Ex- exactly. Exactly. It doesn't it, have to it, be a big item. It can be. It can but be. It doesn't yeah. have to be. You could also, you know, I guess you could technically count like, you know, 12 paper clips on day 12. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of cheap. Don't no, do that. Don't do that. It's the box. <laughs> Come on. No cheating. Yeah. That's right. That's oh, for sure. Shoot. So we're consumed. With spending this economy basically exists on spending so mm. i mean stimulus oh we're wow. stimulate things yes. we're yeah stimulate things and uh what this does uh, rachel talked about it over dinner one night because rachel of our three kids is the spender and she's obviously the one that is on the television on the radio shows does podcasts on best-selling books on money which is irony of ironies <laughs> but the uh but rachel's uh her she talked about it it was almost like detoxing Mm. Yes. You know, it was a cleansing sense, a sense of, ah, I just feel better. Yeah. yeah. I'm complete in an empty room. Mm. And, and so there's nothing wrong with the stuff. It enhances my life. It augments my life. But it's not me. It's not part of my identity. Unfortunately, it has become part of our identity. I am this thing. Mm-hmm. And we even use terms like, I love my truck, or I love my house, or I love my bed. There's nothing wrong with enjoying things. We get confused when we love our truck, but I also love my wife. <laughs> I love my daughter. <laughs> It's a little different. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> a little different. Yeah. The documentary is Less Is Now. It is on Netflix. Both of the documentaries are still on Netflix. As a matter of fact, you can go see the original and see the whole sequence that way if you want to. Yeah. Uh, Joshua Milburn, Ryan Nicodemus are my guests this half hour. And, um, you know, we want people to take control of their money. We want them to get out of debt. And how does minimalism fit into that? I mean, that's really why I started. Um, I wanted to reclaim my time. I was, uh, like I said earlier, I was working 60, 70, sometimes 80 hours a week to pay all of these debt payments. And uh, yeah, I, I saw minimalism as an opportunity for me to simplify, for me to get rid of as much debt as possible. And really, I mean, Dave, my original plan was to go be a barista. I was going to go serve coffee 20, 30 hours a week. But in order to get there, I had to get rid of some stuff and I had to get rid of some debt. Now, uh, the minimalist was a beautiful accident. Ten years later, I still hope to be a barista one day, by the way. Okay. Just haven't got there yet. I'm well, you got a machine out here. If you want to make some people still, coffee, they you would let practice, me touch the espresso can. machine? All right. Yeah, we, we can let you practice. <laughs> But, but you know, I, I really just wanted to get my time back. And that's that's what I think minimalism can help uh, anyone do. Anyone who is dissatisfied with the status quo, anyone who wants an opportunity to start over, I think minimalism is a way that people can do that. It's, I, don't want, I don't want people to mistake it for the way. Like, we're not just saying it. minimalism is, but it's a way. It's a tool that people can use well, to reclaim Well, in an, in an time. area that we're just so overwhelmed, it's time to get a little underwhelmed. Mm-hmm. I mean, you Amen. know, minimalism. Yeah. Hey, Peace. new book coming out. You guys come back in July when this comes out yeah. love people use things be watching for it yeah. and probably learn about it at the minimalist.com maybe a pre-purchase this is an advanced reader copy i got yeah. i'm not giving it back either love people <laughs> use things because the opposite never works right. amen we yeah. will sign it for you absolutely <laughs> do it right now thanks guys love you guys appreciate you we hanging out you with too, us man. man thank you so much thank you Dave.
Hey folks, I got a great option to help you pay for your education. The Army National Guard. The Army National Guard believes you are the next greatest generation because you have proven that even in adversity, that you have what it takes to succeed. That's why they offer benefits like tuition assistance, career training, and a paycheck to help you avoid debt. No matter what your goals are, the Army National Guard can help you get there. Visit NationalGuard.com to find out more. Gears here on the Ramsey Show. I am Dave Ramsey, your host. Rachel Cruz, my co-host today, and my daughter. Uh, nice to have the m- minimalist guys drop in. Always fun I to know. see those guys. They're oh. just the nicest guys on the planet. They're awesome. They're so ridiculously great. nice, actually. Oh yeah. Well, they're very <laughs> nice and have an incredible message. Everything they do, I'm like, yes, amen, yes. Yes and amen. Yes mm-hmm. and amen. In the lobby of Ramsey Solutions on the debt-free stage, Bobby and Michelle are with us. Hey guys, how are you? Hey Hello. Dave. Hey Rachel. <laughs> Hi guys. Welcome. Good to have you guys. Thank and you for where do you guys us. live? Danville, Virginia. I love it. And all the way to Nashville to do a debt-free scream. <laughs> yes, sir. Fine. How much have you guys paid off? $139,970.92. Oh, my love gosh. Love it. And how long did this take? Six years. Good for you. And your range of income during that time? 29000 up to 85000 this year. Wow. What do y'all Amazing. do for a living? We're both teachers. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, how fun. Cool. What do y'all teach? I teach uh, fourth grade, and mm-hmm. he teaches uh, seventh, eighth grade math. Yep. Ah, good. Very cool. <laughs> so what kind of debt was this 140000 Well, Dave, I'm sorry everything. to say <laughs> everything. We we're normal. Actually, most of it was my debt, mm-hmm. and uh, I brought it into the marriage six years ago, mm-hmm. and we took FPU as uh, our pre-marriage counseling. Mm-hmm. And, um, oh, my gosh, I just got to tell you. <laughs> As a man, to bring that kind of debt into a marriage and watch that debt settle on her um, was just very, very difficult. Uh. I'd been carrying that debt around for almost 30 years. Didn't bother you till you set it on her. Did not. (laughs) And then I saw, you know, at first she was like, oh, my gosh, it's not that bad. We can handle this. We can do this. And then over the months I saw it settle in on her, and it it really broke my heart. Mm. Well, the thing is, too, um, I'm, I guess, like a unicorn sort of. I never had debt. Um, I've never had a credit score. Um, I had never taken out a car loan, loans to go to school, nothing. So I love your parents. I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I never had debt, but I never really had a plan with money either. So I was still living paycheck to paycheck. So when I met the love of my life, I'm just like, oh, that debt's not that bad, whatever. I never felt the weight of the debt. Um, wow, and that's his, interesting. Yeah, his debt-free journey, that, that debt got added little by little by little. Oh, yeah. And then when we got married, it's like someone took 300 pounds and put it on my shoulders and went, hey, mm-hmm. here you go. Enjoy carrying that. So what, um, he, what he was observing, that heaviness was real. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah about, about a year into our marriage, it, um, yeah, it, was, it was rough. Um, mm. And I remember our, our, our uh, budget meetings were not good. No. Um, mm. we've, because we did... Um, FPU is pre-marriage counseling. We've never really had a money fight, mm-hmm. but some of those budget meetings were like, okay, how are we going to, how are we going to put food on the table this yeah. month? Let's figure yeah. it out. Yeah. Yeah. So at $29,000 that year, that first year, uh, yeah. it, it was, it was hard. Yeah. Yeah. I bet. It yeah. was hard. So and, what uh, was it? Mostly student loans? <laughs> no, uh, a lot of student loans. I've got a PhD, so it was a lot of student loans, mm-hmm. but, um, we had, uh, I had, three credit cards uh, that had maxed out. Mm -hmm. And uh, over the years, uh, we had to deal with creditors. And so, and we've taught uh, almost 13 FPU classes, I think, in local momentum at our church. And uh, true true fact, during some of those FPU classes, I was getting calls from creditors. Mm -hmm. During the class. (laughs) During the class. Like, you know, it it was hard dealing with those creditors, but we were able to uh, negotiate those settlements and stuff. We got sued by Bank of America. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually went to court with a briefcase and and (laughs) dealt with opposing attorneys on that. Wow. Lots to tell there that we don't have time, but um, (laughs) just it it was a long six years. We made several different job changes along the way so that we could line up our passions with uh, our financial goals. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, so now we're getting ready to enter our first uh, summer break as teachers, uh, completely debt free. We've moved into a new house and uh, working on our baby step three. And so wow. just absolutely loving life right now. And the, be- the best thing is the kids keep asking if we can do um, an actual vacation, a real vacation real instead vacation. of day trips places. Nah, <laughs> no Dave trips. No, wait a minute. The real vacation is the day trips. <laughs> right. Come on. I love it. Way to go, you guys. So you guys, I mean, this journey for you all, because you hear people, they start for different reasons, right? Yeah. You hear some people like, yeah, you know, I just realized, oh, all my money's leaving, so I'm going to get out of debt so I get my income, you know. But you guys, I mean, it was out of out of pain. Out of pain. Yes. And it, it, is, yes. it is very yes, visceral it for me. Mm-hmm. I know I'm going to break yeah. down and cry when we do our scream. <laughs> mm-hmm. and, and it's very appropriate that you guys have the brave heart freedom because it, it is very visceral for me. Yeah. Mm, so tell me, nice. so from that pain, and now you guys are on the other side, standing on the stage, what was it like, like when you paid off that final debt? What are what emotionally? How are you feeling now? So I, I think, versus then. Yeah, I think when we first paid it off, I kept, I kept waiting for something else to happen, mm-hmm. and it didn't, it didn't really hit. Um, and then one day, like I was just driving in the car, and then I was thinking about it, and I'm like. Like, oh, my God, we're, we're debt-free. Remember, I cried all the way home because mm. I'm like, oh, my gosh. And it finally really, really hit mm. because yeah. it felt like, especially early on, when we would take one step forward, we'd get knocked back yeah. two steps. Sure. Um, sure. And we'd, you know, sell a bunch of stuff and be like, hey, we're going to throw that towards debt. But then we had to put it in our budget because we, we couldn't pay the bills. Mm. Um, yeah. So I just kept waiting for something to happen. And then it clicked. And I'm like... Oh my gosh! Like we actually did it. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> I'm, I'm so proud of you. For, for me, it you guys was, are amazing. Thank you. <laughs> for me, it was uh, not so much the the final payment and and calling her and telling her, yeah, we we just did it. But the next week, I checked my FICO score for the very first time in my life. <laughs> and after being hounded by creditors, after walking into court with a briefcase to you know, because Bank of America had sued us. I did a credit check for the first time, and it it said there's no way to determine your credit score because you don't have enough credit history. <laughs> Woo-hoo! So, yes, <laughs> you joined the club, baby. <laughs> I love it. You joined the club. She was already a member she of. She was already a member. <laughs> <laughs> that is so awesome. We are weird. Yeah. So when people ask and they say you paid off a hundred and forty thousand dollars, how did you do that? What do you tell them the secret is? Oh my gosh. Um. God, um, because that's that's something that's you know your faith is something that you'll you always have no matter what you know numbers in your bank account, um, budgeting and absolutely teamwork. Teamwork. Um, I Gotta think be teamwork. yeah I think because we did FPU as kind of our pre-marriage counseling, we were both on the same plan and Being on, on the, the same, same team. Yeah, and so when it came down to a question with money or, or a budget or anything, we just kind of fell back to that teaching um, from the class we'd been through. And it's odd. Like we really have never had a money fight and we've cried together. A oh lot. my gosh. So much, <laughs> so much. Um, or been angry at bank of America together. Oh yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, but I think sometimes too, um, God has definitely gotten us through a lot of it because there were times where, you know, I was breaking down and he couldn't break down. So he had to rely on his faith to be strong or the other way around. Um, I know one week in particular, we had a horrific budget meeting. It was so bad. Like we could barely afford anything. So all week long, when anything bad happened, my first thought was, it's a train. It, that's a train. And so we went to church that Sunday and they had a guest preacher and he pointed us, us to and brought us up. Can everyone else is up at the altar? And he looked at me and he said, hey, it's a light. And I'm like, oh God, thank you. So wow. sometimes we, yeah. And I'm just like, and I'm like, why did you say that? And he's like, I don't know. Just, I felt like I needed to give you that message. And I'm like, oh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> yeah, for those of you who don't know, it's a light at the end of the tunnel that is not an oncoming train. It's a phrase we say around here all the time. Yes. So that puts that whole thing into context. Wow, you guys. <laughs> amazing, amazing, amazing. Woo-hoo! If I could say one thing to the people listening out there, you know, there are a lot of calls, debt-free calls and debt-free people, and I don't want yeah. to take away from any uh, any of it, but um, <laughs> six years is a long time. Yeah, it and, is. And, and we went through a lot over those six years. We cash flowed a bunch of surgeries. There were a lot of ups and downs, yeah. but we always stayed committed. And I just want to tell those people that are listening out there yeah. that, that don't lose the faith. I mean, you, you can keep 
keep so good. pushing, it will happen. Mm. Be quit. intentional about everything that you do with your money. Amen. Bobby and Michelle, Lynchburg, <laughs> Virginia, 140000 paid off in six years, making twenty nine to eighty five. Count it down. Let's hear a debt-free scream. <laughs> Three, two, one. We are debt-free! <laughs> That's what it sounds like after six years Amazing. right there. Amazing. Oh, Woo! so much. So Woo! much. Oh. Rachel Cruz, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today, best-selling author, number one best-selling author of several books. Her latest is Know Yourself, Know Your Money, New York Times best-selling book. Uh, discover why you handle money the way you do and what to do about it. Now, your money conversations are about to get a lot easier. Rachel just launched the Know, it Yourse- know Yourself Money Assessment. The assessment will guide you to lasting progress towards your money goals and better money communication. How's it do that, Rachel? Yes. Well, it's an assessment, which I love assessments. If you read the book, you know, at the beginning, I talk about understanding myself more. And you can do that, you know, through whether it's the Enneagram or DISC or Myers-Briggs. But, like, even just taking a test, I'm like, oh, when you read the report, you're like, that's me, that's me. I just, I love it because it gives so much insight. So, after doing this book, I was like, I want people to be able to have these conversations because the book revolves so much around your money tendencies, your dreams, your fears, how you grew up with money, all of that. And to be able to have it in a place that you can read your results of, of who you are around money, I think was just so important for yourself. But also, if you're married, if you have, you know, um, parents that you talk to your talk to, uh, to about money, your kids, I mean, all of it. So it, it's a very relational type of tool to use for yourself, but also if you are married specifically. So it takes 15 minutes. Uh, you answer a bunch of questions and then you get a 30 page personalized um, version of, of all your results. And if you take it with someone, like with a spouse, then their results are on um, your results page as well. So you can kind of match up to see, okay, where are we on the same page, where are we different? All of it. Yeah. Why do you make decisions the way you do? Are you scarcity? Are you abundance? Are yeah. you a saver? Are you a spender? Nerd, free spirit. What are your money fears versus your spouse's money fears? Yep. And uh, the uh, our team that built this, this product is, it's over the top incredible. I'm so proud of of the 30 pages that it spits out for yes. you because it's going to have a line and there sits your little picture, your husband's little picture, your wife's little picture, whatever. And you're looking right there and you're going, Oh yeah, I kind of knew that, but this kind of gives verbiage to it. And then you can talk about it. It becomes a communication tool. Know yourself, you know, is number one. Uh, then number two, you've got to know your spouse yep. and you know why they do this. And you know, when I, you know, when uh, your mom is a saver, and when she has that tendency towards saving, um, she's really not trying to kill all the fun. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> I just have to remember that sometimes. That's right, that's right. Yeah, and and to understand the why, too. So it kind of gets down very granular in all of that, which is which is so fun. So, yeah, you can take it, obviously, if you're married with your spouse or even just by yourself. If you're single out there and you just want to understand more of how you're wired with money, you can take it. This is one of the best things that we have put out in a long time. And I urge every one of you to run over right now, take this assessment very quickly. Uh, It's at RamseySolutions.com. It is the Know Yourself Money Assessment. Know Yourself Money Assessment. And we're not charging that much for it. What's the price on it? It's not on here. You don't know. Uh, okay. The price point changed it so to look at to see how many okay. quali- yeah, quantities Yeah, we moved, moved it around because yeah. I was arguing with them about the price. Okay. Because it's really it's really very, very reasonable. I do I do know that. So be sure and check it out. RamseySolutions.com. The Know Yourself Money 
assessment. Mark is in Traverse City, Michigan. Hey, Mark, welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hi, Dave. Hi, Rachel. How are you doing? Big fans. Uh, we, me, My wife and I use your principles, and thank you so much for everything that you've done for uh, my wife and my family's life, first of all. Well, thank you. How can we help? Well, I'm, uh, we're, my, my wife and I are in baby steps four, five, and six right now. We make about 130, 140,000 a year, and we've pulled up a bunch of cash right now to pay for uh, my first vehicle post uh, baby steps one through uh, three. And I'm replacing my beater essentially right now. And we have about 30,000 saved up right now to buy a half ton tr- uh, pickup truck that we're looking for. Um, but as you know, the, the housing market and the vehicle market are almost uh, identical on the supply and demand issue that's having with it right now. And I'm a little leery about trying to buy a vehicle that I feel is overvalued anywhere between five and $8,000 only to have the supply chain issue get corrected in this fall. Do you have any opinions on, uh, the vehicle market right now in, in, in regards to that question? I don't have any opinions that would be based in fact only feelings, so I will qualify it with that. Mm-hmm. But as you've already ascertained, we uh, those of us in business have observed that when the factories quit sh- making new things, the supply of new things was gone, meaning new cars. You can't find a new car. Certain brands, you can't, still can't find them. They've cranked the factories back up, but you still, still haven't gotten them all the way to the car lots. And when there's no new cars available, guess what that does? It sends all the new car buyers into the used car market where the used car buyers already were. Now you've got twice as many people, give or take, chasing the same number of cars. That is going to drive price up artificially until the marketplace gets some equilibrium, meaning that the supply of new comes in again and relaxes the used the strain on the used car market, relaxing the pricing. I don't know when that is. Uh, I'll give you a wild guess, my, but it's it's worth what yeah. you paid for it. I'm just telling you, I have no idea. <laughs> I'm going to guess and say by fall, you're going to get equilibrium in that market. It may take longer in housing. but the, the well, And specifically that's... trucks. I mean, Mark, honestly, my team, we were just doing a deep dive on specific used section cars suvs minivans like we've done these studies and, and found oh like you, you actually have some information well, no no well just to say that trucks has been our hardest um sector of car i don't even know how you would say a vehicle type of, type of car uh because they're they ne- they do not lose their value i mean they trucks hold their value well, it they seems, do, but not as much not as much but i mean like it, it's honestly as we've done research to find good quality used trucks we've been looking around the twenty five thousand dollar mark i'm like and they're hard to find so when you said truck specifically for that's whatever even, reason that's even there. more so because probably honestly construction's put a strain on them yeah yeah that's probably it's, true. um the, the other side the other side of this coin is, is that i have a the, the current beater that i'm driving around right now it's a 2007 um you know I'm, I'm having to put a little bit of money into it to keep it going and so i'm just trying to figure out when should i just you know metaphorically pull the trigger on buying the vehicle regardless of its perceived value right now and that's yeah. i guess that's where i'm struggling what's with your household income keep putting money in uh, 130 140,000 okay so if you overpay by five grand it so. does not end your life no it does not <laughs> so you know none of these are going to end your life so it's just a matter it's almost like a game now it's just you know yeah when yeah. do i buy this because i just want it and by god i have the money now now that i'm out of debt um and it's not the end of the world uh it's not like you know if you were going to say you're going to lose 50 grand making 130 we got to stop and think about this a long time but five grand i don't want to waste five thousand dollars but five thousand dollars over the scope of the next decade really does not affect you yeah yeah i agree with you i'm just uh yeah so at some point the stress at some point the stress is over and you go i got the money i'm buying it (laughs) that's what my wife would say (laughs) yeah but i you know and i don't know when no i'm just saying i don't i'm not saying that points today it might be you say okay i'm going to drive this thing until uh the end of august or until it gives me one more repair equal to x and then i'm out of here because i'm Mm -hmm. done screwing with this thing okay you know, or whatever. You could put yeah. any kind. You could put a timeline on it. You could put a money amount on the beater repair on it, and let that be your trigger to cause you to jump ship and go do the deal. Um, or you could say, "I'm just waiting on these dadgum things to come back down, and then I'll do it." You know, you could go. You, you can put the trigger on it wherever you want. But the the point is, if you really mess this up, you didn't mess up anything bad. Right. Right. Given your ratios and your overall situation. So pan back and look at the scope of your life, pan back and look at the other thing and, and go how much longer or, you know, and then that, that frees you up to start looking for a reasonably priced truck today 
And at any time you found one, you could just you could do it. You don't have to say, I'm not going to be in the market. Right. You know, Continue like housing work. market's kind of crazy. You don't have to say, I'm not going to be in the market. But you can say, I'm not going to bid up to $50,000 over what those houses are going for. Just yeah. to get in line with the 43 other people that are white hot and have the fever. It's crazy. Uh, you can say, I'm not going to get in that line, but I'm also going to kind of keep poking around. I might stumble into a deal. I might find a sweet little old lady who wants to sell it to a guy just like me, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and that's what you're looking for, right? And that, that, you know, you do find those things and you don't find them if you're not out there wandering around. Just the, what you want to avoid is getting the fever. It's the fever that'll get you. That puts this hour of the Ramsey Show in the books. It's Kelly, associate producer and phone screener for The Ramsey Show. If you would like to do your debt-free screen live on the show, make sure you visit theramseyshow.com and register. We would love for you to come to Nashville and tell Dave your story. This is The Ramsey Show. You can be intentional about your character. You can have money and a career. You are the hero in your story. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the Dollar Car Rental Studios, it's the Ramsey Show, where debt is dumb, cash is king, and the paid-off home mortgage has taken the place of the BMW as the status symbol of choice. I'm Dave Ramsey, your host, Rachel Cruz. Ramsey Personality is my co-host today as we answer your questions about your life and your money. Open phones at 888-825-5225. That's 888 888- 825-5225. It is a free call, and some say the advice is worth exactly what you pay for it. Elizabeth is with us in Tyler, Texas, to start off this hour. Hi, Elizabeth. How are you? Hi. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. What's up? Okay. So um, my house um, shares a driveway with three other homes. Um, and in addition to that, we also share um, a sprinkler system that is all one system for all the houses, as well as a one water meter for just the sprinkler system. Um, so ever since the house was built, um, all the neighbors have shipped in money together into one account that one ma- uh, neighbor manages to pay for the water bill, the upkeep of the sprinkler system. And since we're doing all of that, we also go ahead and just do a lawn service together. Um, historically, the lady who has done it, she's just been in control of it. She's been there since the beginning of the development. I'm sorry, say, um, say that. I didn't hear that first is, part. It, you broke up. What, what about the first of the development? What? So the, the lady who's been running it in the past, um, she, or managing that account in the past, she mm-hmm. was there from the very beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, she is turning 92 this year, oh. and it is time for her to pass it on to someone else. Wow. Okay. Um Yes. So I am willing to take care of it. It's very little work. I mean, on a typical month, we only have two bills, um, just the water bill and the yard bill. Uh Um, So it's not a whole lot of work. The thing that has me concerned is making sure it's set up properly in a way where the account where the money is held is not considered a business income account for me or something that I totally control so that everyone's protected. I don't want to get audited by the IRS and get in trouble and for them to get business income, but I also want my neighbors to have access to it if something were to happen to me. Um, you know, if I were to get in a car accident or something, if mm-hmm. someone else, you know, it's not my estate's money, it's right. their money. Right. Um, and so I'm trying, I'm just looking for advice on how to go about getting this set up properly so mm-hmm. that we're all all protected equally, you know, fairly. Okay. Uh, there's two or three things involved. One would be the legal ownership of the money and the, how the account is set up. Uh, uh, two would be the tax issue. Um, and right. so, uh, and you can get as complicated as you want to get here. I wouldn't overcomplicate it. I'm guessing that she just opened this account in her name probably and never reported it and wasn't worried about an audit. I'll bet you that's how she was running it, just out of her hip pocket. 
I, I'm fair. I'm fairly certain that is correct. It is technically a business account, yeah. but it is under her social security number yeah, at the moment. Which means that technically she could have been taxed on yeah. this if it were profitable, if she were ever audited. Probably a fairly low likelihood, right. and she was willing to take that chance. Um, if you want to go a step beyond that, you need to just form an entity and with the IRS and get an EIN number, an electronic identification number. And that's what you would mm-hmm. get. That's the same number you would get if you got if you formed an LLC uh, or a sub S corp. If the, that's the next step you could do is form an LLC. I would not. Too dead right. gum much trouble. I would just get an EIN right. with the IRS, and if they ever approach you, just go. It's a separate entity. Three neighbors managing the account. There's no profit, and you could just blow it off in an audit. Uh, but if you put it in your social or in an entity that you run business out of, then you could end up, it could mm-hmm. end up getting blended in. So just order an EIN right. or order, you know, it takes about, used to take 90 days online. Now it probably doesn't take that long. You probably get one overnight now. Uh, and you just open that, you use that instead of a social security number to open the account and just open the account and give it a name called the neighbors. I don't care. And, um, the neighbor's water account. I don't know. And then you just throw it. And then if right. you if you have a written one page document of agreement with your neighbors, there's never been any drama so far. Right. Correct. It's okay. all, everyone's agreed to it. Yeah. I mean, I guess technically if the house ever sold to someone who didn't want to be a part of it. That could, in theory, happen. Yeah, yeah. Not have and I wouldn't. Like, I really wouldn't go to the expense to legally bind all this, I, or to mess up one of your ownership right. positions with this. Um, you just have to work that out with the new neighbor, one way or the other, and it might not be relationally pretty, but it won't be a legal problem. So anyway, just I, I right. would have a one-page document with your neighbors that just says in in a letter form what it says. I'm not an attorney. This is just what I would do personally. Just so there's clear mm-hmm. communication with your neighbors, put all of them on the checking account and open a checking account with a fresh EIN, and I would just run it that way. That's how I would do it. Just keep it real clean. If you want to go further, you could form a nonprofit with a board and an LLC. Now you got to file tax return on that every year, and you got to file with your state every year, and it's a complete pain in the butt for something like this. It's tremendous overkill. Right. Um, just follow up question to that. I did look into getting an EIN, um, and you have to declare a responsible party. Yeah. Which means, in a way, it would still be a tied to me. Is there any concern? I, 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 would, I would have still. With that? I would. I wouldn't worry about that. The big deal is, in the event you're okay. audited, you have a clear paper trail that this is a separate entity and it has no profit to it. It has no profit motive to it. It's a simple transactional account. Screw you. We're not owing any taxes on it. I mean, you can beat this audit in 20 right. seconds, and if you don't, then I'm going to beat it yeah. in 20 minutes over the top of somebody's head. That's. That, that's just a, it's just a matter of you've got to find somebody in the IRS has half a brain to explain it to. That might be a challenge, but you got to, you just have to work that through. If you have time, I have a completely different question. I'm sorry. I do not. I apologize, but thank you for the call. I hope that helps you. We appreciate you joining us. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Nate is in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Hey, Nate, how are you? Good. How's it going, Dave? Better than I deserve. What's up? Great. Okay, so my question here, I'm uh, 29. I make about 50000 a year. Now, I have some medical debt, uh, mostly like hospital and doctor bills that have gone to my credit report, uh, totaling up to about uh, sixteen to $17,000. I just started listening to your podcast about mm, three months ago. And back in November last year, I did something I <laughs> realized now I don't want to do, and I went and bought a car. And uh, so now I've got this twenty-one, twenty-two thousand dollars of car debt and medical debt, and I want to get out of it. I just a few days ago purchased the uh, total money makeover, and I'm just wondering where do I start? Yeah, it's a great question, Nate. I mean, well, specifically with the debt, uh, paying how many how many medical debts do you have that total that sixteen thousand? I want to say it's about eleven, ten or eleven things on my credit report smaller ones yeah yeah and then anything else besides the car that's it that's it well i would list out all of those i mean even though it's 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 10 or 11 of them but listing them out smallest to largest starting with that smallest one and then working your way down and the and the car thing yeah i mean the twenty-two thousand. you don't have to sell it gets to a point that you could say yeah it's not worth it anymore and see what the hit was that you took what's your household income yeah 50 50. 
Yeah, you're right on the bubble. That's a lot of car. It's a lot of car, um, 50 grand. Yeah, yeah, I'd probably consider reversing that decision, meaning selling the car, if it were me, just because I'd want to clean this mess up faster than that and plow through that 16000 in medical debt using the debt snowball. That'll get you there. You got the right tools coming to you. And thank you for being a listener. Stop paying your overpriced wireless provider and switch to Pure Talk. They use the same network as the larger providers for much less. For just $30 a month, get unlimited talk, text, and six gigs of data with no contract. The Irish family saves over $70 a month by switching to Pure Talk. Just go to puretalk.com and enter the promo code RAMSEY to save 50% off your first month. Pure Talk, simply smarter wireless. Rachel Cruz, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today, also my daughter, author of three national, four national bestsellers, and the latest one, Know Yourself, Know Your Money. We are launching today the Know Yourself Money Assessment. Now, this assessment is incredible. It will guide you to lasting progress towards your money goals and better money communication because you will understand yourself. You'll understand your money tendencies, your money fears, your money upbringing after you take the assessment, and your spouse can take it with you. Uh, It takes about 15 minutes to take it. It spits out 30 pages of detailed and personalized insights. Really end up knowing what's going on, don't you? Oh, yeah. Every part of why you see money the way you do from your upbringing to your tendencies to your fears your motivations your actions all of it so it's uh it's always fascinating i i love this stuff personally i was excited to work with the team on it because i think assessments in general are just so interesting I'm like, well oh, the it quality just exposes a lot so the quality of the research and the quality <laughs> of the um i don't know the graphic detail <laughs> that it puts out the way the graphics look is what yes, I'm trying to yeah. say. Oh yes, yes. The, the way the graphics look, the way it's laid on the page to understand it. Oh, it's beautiful. I'm just really proud of uh, our team. Well, they did a beautiful job it's designing really, it. It's really, really, really. We should have charged twice as much as we're charging for it. Yeah. I, well, to that point, though, honestly, the visual. Yes. Once you get your results, the 30 pages. Yes. Like yeah. you're saying, visually. Yeah. It just tells you exactly what's going on. It's so easy to read and on. understand. Yeah. It's crazy. It's wonderful. In that regard, I remember a thousand years ago, I took the disc assessment. I mean, I, man, it. 30 years ago so the first time i ever saw anything like this and i it was so amazing because i had like 27 questions and it read my mail you know it's like this is who you are i'm a high d high i on the disc and everybody kind of knows that duh. and but i went home i handed it to sharon and she's reading through it and she starts laughing and she goes oh this is what's wrong with you and i went no that is me <laughs> <laughs> that's not what's wrong with me this is all and the so, stuff yeah it took her it took us about uh 10 years after that to convince her her particular type of disc was not the right one and everybody else's was the wrong one but yeah but this tells you not who's right or who's wrong it tells you what your tendencies are and then you say okay i have a tendency to be a spender versus a saver so i have to guard against the toxic version of that yes and uh so on so it's only 20 dollars to take it 30 dollars for a couple so jump in there take it with your spouse tonight go to ramseysolutions.com the know yourself money assessment you take you to the next level ramseysolutions.com again 20 bucks for singles 30 dollars for couples we should have charged we should have charged double because it's it's really you're going to get it and you're going to go y'all aren't charging enough all right our question of the day comes from blinds.com find out for yourself why blinds.com is the number one online retailer of custom window coverings you get free samples free shipping and with the new promos they run every month you'll save even more use the promo code ramsey to get the best possible deal Today's question comes from Jamie in Indiana. We follow the Ramsey plan with our finances and are trying to teach our young children the same principles. We have a chore chart and are learning that they must work to get paid. However, every time we see my parents, they give our children money. It's becoming difficult to keep them engaged in the lessons we are trying to teach when grandparents just hand them cash. How do we handle this situation? (laughs) You know, I've not started doing that yet. I should do that. 
I should mess up your parenting by yeah, giving the no, kids cash. No, no, It's like the swing set example. That's always what I always tell people. At Christmas that year when Denise asked for a swing, and y'all yeah. bought a swing, and then y'all bought a swing set. She was like, I just want a Fisher Price baby swing. That's all I want. And y'all got, and, we, and oh. we literally looked at each other, me and Denise were like, oh, it begins. Here it is. <laughs> and so it Papa begins. Papa Dave just throws Papa out Dave everything. Papa Dave just went overboard. And just, yeah. No, but but honestly, Jamie, I'm like, this, this, is, a, this is a, people have this question a lot yeah. because grandparents have the entitlement as they feel to do whatever they want with the children and then they send them on home and you're like no we have a bedtime all of this but um you know i wouldn't be crazy uptight jamie i mean i think depending on the age of your kids and depending on how much they're doing it if they're just kind of having fun with them there is a level where i give grace to grandparents where they can love on the kids but if you find that it's truly affecting like their character and they really 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 are saying like i don't want to do chores because i can just go to mimi and papa's and they just give me money then yeah then we probably want to circle back and have a conversation with the grandparents your parents to say hey this is what we're trying to implement in our home and because of your generosity and your big wonderful hearts it is kind of messing with it but Again, I, I'm so balanced in this because I know some people, Jamie, I'm not saying this is you, can that are on the Rams plane are very legalistic. They're like, no, if you do not, do, rah, 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 and then they don't allow any amount of like gifts or grandparents to be grandparents. So there's a level of that that is life. But if it goes to the extreme, then yeah, you may want to circle back and have a conversation. Yeah, yeah, and, and I, I think um, the question I always ask is, um, is, is this really about you and your mom or is this really about the kids getting money mm. and is there something else going on that's a dr john, john deloney thing that's uh not really a money grandparents i don't know how you know it, it's just like your mother is overbearing and this is one example where she's out of control and has no boundaries and uh so you decide to use this one to come down on that overall issue and so yep. that, if that's going on, then that's, this is not the f way to fight the fight. You got to fight the fight a different way on that. Yep. So, but I, again, it's not going to screw it up. The other thing I will say is this, um, they can go, uh, to the next door neighbors and eat ice cream and you find out about it later and you don't allow ice cream because of your nutritional beliefs or whatever. I'm making up some bizarre example here. But, I mean, the kids are – and that does not give them permission to come home and demand ice cream. So, you know, the, the reason we teach children how to handle money is not really about money. It's really about them building a generosity muscle, building a saving muscle, building a wise spending muscle, building a work ethic and so when we put chores on the refrigerator, we're going to incentivize you on the positive side with money. But at the end of the day, you're still going to do the freaking chores because it is my job as your dad to make you learn how to work so that when you grow up, you don't live in my basement. And so I can explain that to a four-year-old. I can explain it to a six-year-old. I can explain it to a 12-year-old that, yes, your Mimi and Papa gave you some money, but we do this thing with money here because I'm trying to teach you that money comes from work, not Mimi and Papa. You're not going to get a trust fund that you're going to be able to live on the back of a yacht. So you're going to have to learn to work, puppy. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to work with you on that. So, yes, they give you money, and that's nice, but it doesn't give you an exemption right, from right. feeding the dog. That's right. That's your chore. Yeah. And so I'm going to play – Honey, this is why I'm teaching you this. Mm -hmm. Honey, you're going to do this. It's so not really nice optional. of you that you, you're telling the why, you know? There you go. When Rachel was little, it was just, no, just you just shut do up it. and do it. You just yeah. do it. Oh, well. Now we're going to explain the why. You turned out. I you turned love out. it. You no, out. this is so good. This is so good. <laughs> no, but really, it, and then it just becomes the point of disobedience. That's yeah. that's the hard thing, too. Because you do have kids like mine. I'm like, they're so different. One is motivated to yeah. do it and should clean the playroom. She's like, do I get my dollar? Like she, yeah. And the other one just basically is the like. The compliant one and the rebellious one. Yes, I yes. Mean, so, so, so you're going to deal with that yeah. anyway. Yeah. Oh, by the way, when you tell the rebellious one to do something and why and they don't do it and then you just tell them they have to do it anyway all they remember is that part <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> maybe so just in case maybe so just in case <laughs> just in but case things you're do wondering. circle back <laughs> oh. the middle child the middle child in, our, in my family now you got Caroline, you got i am now you got, getting you myself got you as a middle child for and sure i'm really sorry you are your your yeah. your middle one is absolutely wonderful she is a rock star. 
<laughs> she is a rock star. She is so sweet and so tough already. <laughs> She's her mom made over. It's great. So, yeah, yeah, that's a good question because the boundary thing with grandparents is uh, – uh, Deloney and I were laughing about this on the air the other day. The Christmas when I bought all the kids those big plastic cars and none of them were big enough to drive them yet. Yes. And the whole too. living room was full of them. And it was like I completely overdid it. I loved it. And nobody loved it but me. I was the only it's one like, that Dad, had fun. they're two. They can barely like, they sit can't, up They can't even own. get into like, it. They can't walk yet, but I got them in my car. Yeah, so, um, yeah, it's, yeah, you got to have boundaries somewhere. But uh, and new, the, one of the questions Deloney and I had was a new baby, the first grandbaby. Oh yeah. And that's the one. That's the one where you learn all of this stuff, inter- interacting with your grown kids and your grandkids, and how it's going to turn out. This is the Ramsey Show. personality best-selling author is my co-host today open phones at 888-825-5225 bill's in kansas city hey bill what's up hey bill how's it going hey bill hey dave it's okay (laughs) i knew what you meant it's all good yeah how can we help sir um hey so um i actually had a quick question for you um so um, I've, I've actually moved cross country a couple times now, and I finally found uh, a city and um, a job that I like, and was thinking about buying a house. Um, I don't want to take out a mortgage, um, but and, and so so when I was taking inventory of um, what cash I had, I found out I had um, about a hundred grand uh, in a five twenty nine. Um, uh, 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 that's kind of stuck there. Uh, in your for you. Days. Yeah, for me. Well, my, my par- it was my parents left over. Uh, my parents uh, 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 funded those assets. Um, for and, you to go to college. I went to teach school. With- That's correct. And That's you didn't correct. use it? Um, Why and, didn't you and- use it? Well, I had a full scholarship, and, and, and uh, I went to cheap school. So we already Great. Through, when was uh, that? The, the when did you go to the cheap school? Uh, six, seven years ago. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, well, well, what I are the mean, cheap school? What are the cheap school? Like, how many scholarships? How many dollars in scholarships did you get? Uh, in total, about twenty grand. Okay, might not be worth the trouble. Yeah. But here, here's what you can do. Okay, if you pull money out of a five twenty nine, there's a big penalty, as you know. Okay, right. Uh, you can leave it in there, get married, have kids, use it for your kids, use it for your new wife, okay. whatever, use it for your PhD, okay. whatever. Or you could go back and get some professional tax advice because I don't know what to do with something this old. But here's the rule on 529s. You can take out of a 529 whatever your scholarship money was equal to and have no penalties or taxes. And so if you had $20,000 in scholarships, you can pull $20,000 out of your 529 and have no taxes or penalties on it. Okay. But we got to go back in the years that you filed those tax returns or didn't file those tax returns or whatever. And it, you may have to file like an amended return to pull all that off. I don't know how that part will work. But in theory, you could okay. pull out how much you had in scholarships. If it was last year, it'd be real easy to do. Okay. And Bill, do yep. you have kids? Right. Are you married, got kids or anything? Uh, no, no. No, no. I'm, I'm single. Okay. So. All right. Because the 529 can pass down. You can pass it down later. You can just let it yeah, sit there. Yeah, I was going to say. You can... But you can't use it for the house without heavy penalties. Yeah. It's going to be, I think it's a 20% penalty plus taxes on all the growth. So you're going to get hammered. The 100000 is going to turn into sixty by the time you pull it out if you use it for the house. I would not use it for that uh, unless I could find scholarship money to apply against it, do an amended return, and get the money out that way. That'd be the only way I could. And come then up you would with. just leave it to roll over to, yeah, his kids if he has kids in the future or yeah, 
Open phones at 888-825-5225. Denise is with us. Denise is in Indianapolis. Hi, Denise. How are you? I'm well. How are you? Better than I deserve. What's up? That's what I thought. (laughs) Uh, I am 57 years old. I'm hoping to retire in five years. I'm a teacher, and my salary is 43000 a year. I have retirement income from previous jobs, uh, two pensions that equal $1,000 a month. And um, I have my uh, three to six months saved up. I have six months saved up in my emergency fund. My question is, being this close to retirement, uh, and I didn't expect to retire uh, on my own, by the way, uh, divorced about five years ago. Mm-hmm. So recovering from that. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got my six months in. My job is stable. I was wondering if I should take three months of that salary and put it into mutual funds instead of letting the cash uh, sit in the bank. Denise, do you have any other retirement? Any other money to your name uh, I for have, retirement? I have a traditional IRA that's currently worth 14000 And I have a 401k through my current job, uh, currently sitting at uh, a right, right over 3000 And I've got 15% of my uh, salary going into that. Okay. Good. That's great. Um, oh, yeah. So- and- Oh, Let yes, me add yes. this one more thing. When I hit 65, I have the annuity that I got from the divorce that will start paying me 800 bucks a month for the rest of my life. But it's between the 62 and 65 that I have to bridge. Mm-hmm. Okay. And you live, you live pretty frugally, obviously. Okay. Yes. So I do. yes, I, I would not put. No I would debt. just put no it in a straight. No debt other than my um, mortgage. Yeah, I just put it in a straight mutual fund. I would not put it into a retirement account because that way, if you run into a more than three month emergency, you can still get at it. But we really aren't going to use it for that. We're really using it for long term investing. But you're comfortable with the three month side of the three to six months because you live frugally. And you've got access to these other monies coming in and stability of income off of the old pensions and that kind of stuff, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, that's fine to do. I wouldn't, I just, you can't call it your emergency fund if you put it in mutual funds. That's just my rule. Right. Because I don't want people putting their emergency fund in mutual funds because the transmission goes out, the mutual fund's down, and then you'll go put it on a credit card because you don't want to cash out your investment while it's down and all this kind of crap starts to play. You use the wrong tool for the wrong job then. But the three months of emergency fund on the three to six month range it's in your situation yeah. is fine. Because do you have kids at home, Denise? Anyone dependent upon? Not. Yeah. So it's just, yeah, it's, it's you at this point, which is, it's just yeah, you're, you're honestly the textbook when we teach who should have three months and who should kind of gear more to that six months you are textbook three month i mean you it's you um not a ton of you know dependence there in the home income is stable it's not like you do freelance work and you have up and down months i mean all of that so yeah denise i think leaving three months in there is is a great plan exactly and all the other indications and everything else you've described indicates you live very much within your means and very frugally the whole way you described your life says yeah, that yeah so you're going to do just great. You're going to do fine with that. Now, the other thing is stay with the 15% going into retirement because that's going to be the big answer to your retirement problem, not this extra three months going into a mutual fund. This extra three months going into mutual funds, a fairly minor click on the dial overall. The big click on the dial was when you started putting 15% of your income away and we start working to get that house paid off. And, you know, when you hit 65, 70, you've got a paid for house and you've built up a pretty good nest egg by then over this next uh, eight to, to 17 years or whatever we end up with here. So, hey, thanks for the call. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Julia is in Colorado Springs. Hi, Julia. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hi, Mr. Ramsey. Thank you for taking my phone call. Sure. What's up? All right. I am a single parent working a part-time job and grateful to have that job after being unemployed for two and a half, excuse me, three years. And I want to thank you also for your show. I It saved my life. So 
I really appreciate your show. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, I am calling to ask you, I did have to declare bankruptcy last year. Mm-hmm. Um, I had three credit cards. They were out of control mm-hmm. um, just so that I could put a roof over mine and my son's head and provide food, et cetera, um, just through a series of events. And I am trying to build up my credit. My car is 16 years old. I am looking at going to college this fall. And right now in the apartments that I live in, I'm hoping to move out. It's just not somewhere where I want to be. Yep. And listen, I have hey, to have listen, a credit score again. You need to have learned your lesson with the bankruptcy that credit is not your supply. Don't build up your credit. Don't go back in debt. It hasn't been a blessing to you. Learn your lesson. Don't build up your credit. That's the answer to your equation. Build up your cash build up money and we'll walk with you and help you rebuild i've been right where you are and scared like you've been so you hang on i'll have kelly pick up we'll get you signed up for financial peace university in a year of ramsey plus we will teach you how to handle money you do not need to build your credit you need to build some wealth and we'll show you how Ramsey personality is my co-host this hour. Open phones at 888-825-5225. You guys jump in. We'll talk about your life and your money. Michelle is with us in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Hi, Michelle. How are you? Hey, I'm great. How are you? Thank you for taking my call. Sure. What's up? Very exciting. Um, My husband and I are on our uh, baby set, too. Uh, It's been amazing and to encourage people out there. If you're starting this journey at 58, it's not too late, and they can change your life. So, And the second most important part is that my husband wants to know what you think for investing. And would you advise sort of to hedge against inflation um, buying, like, gold, some gold coins as part of your emergency fund? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, no. And I wouldn't suggest you buy stock in Home Depot either or Apple or Exxon. Uh, Why? Because the price is too volatile to use as an emergency fund. The purpose of the emergency fund is insurance, not investment. It's there for the rainy day. The umbrella is there for rain only. It is not there to fight off bears. It's just for rain. That makes sense? Yes, indeed. Um, so as so let's say we have the emergency fund in cash. That's all you need. Maybe it's an extra. You can put it in the bank in a savings account if you want. And Michelle, I'll go. Right. And I would go a step further, too, because you were wondering, you said my husband wanting to know about investing and then specifically in gold. But nowhere in the baby steps do we recommend people buy gold, period. So and neither single stocks either, like he was saying. But when it comes Mm -hmm. to investing in that time, still not suggest investing in commodities or anything like that. So in the market, yes, through good growth stock mutual funds or in a retirement vehicle like a Roth IRA, 401k, 403b. But in general, our piece of advice when it comes to investing is to stay away from gold. So let me kind of talk you through something too that's interesting. So what this tells me, by the way, and the way you asked the question was that your husband's been reading crap on the internet, okay, on gold sites. Because a he should I buy this, you said, as a hedge against inflation, okay? Now let's talk about how that works. Here's the way you've heard of a hedge fund, right? Now a hedge against something goes with the thing so the thing doesn't destroy you. Meaning that if you want to do a hedge against inflation, you would have to buy things that are incorporated in inflation. 
inflation is the price of bread going up, the price of oil going up, the price of housing going up, the price of electricity going up, uh, the price of living going up. Gold is not one of those things. It does not follow inflation. There is no correlation between the price of gold and inflation. Zero. There's no correlation between the stock market going up and the stock market going down in gold. Zero. There is some loose correlations that really what gold prices correlate to is fear or greed. When the marketplace deems that the world's falling apart, oh, God, and all the conspiracy theorists come out, then the price of gold is going to go up. But that's what drives the price of gold up, not anything else. And so if you really want to hedge against inflation, you buy real estate, you would buy stock in Exxon, you would buy stock in wheat farms, you would buy stock in things that go up in cost when inflation goes up, when the price of things goes up, the things. You'd buy stock in General Motors because the price of a car is going to go up. You buy stock in Bridgestone because the price of tires are going to go up. That's a hedge against inflation. Gold coins are not. The only place anybody says stuff like that is on their stupid butt gold coin websites. That's the only place that comes up. That's how I know where he's getting the information because it's technically the wrong definition. Does that make sense? Yes. But, mm. So when gold is going up in price, is that's it, inflation. Gold was, is it, no, right. That's inflation. Does gold hold its value? No. Not it's necessarily. Like you go back and pull the gold. You can just go online and pull up gold prices over 50 years. Mm-hmm. And number one, you're going to see about a 5% rate of return. It's got a sucky rate of return. And it's a freaking mm-hmm. roller coaster at Six Flags to get there. It's way up and way down just to get to an av- a boring average. That's why I don't play in it, because it's too freaking volatile. It's too crazy a ride, and I don't find any millionaires that say, I got rich buying gold coins. None. I find a lot of people that got poorer buying gold coins, but I don't find any millionaires in our millionaire study that says I got rich buying gold coins. So this is where it comes from. Yeah, and there, but there is a level, because I just had a conversation with a friend about this recently. There's like this level of security feeling like, yeah, but gold feels safe. Gold, it feels like, I don't know, because you can actually tangibly touch it and see it, whatever the case may be. There's this element of like, oh yeah, we're going to buy gold because it just feels, it feels safer. That's yeah. what they were saying. And well, it, here's, what, here's the weird part of that is. It's not. When, when is it safe? When do you use gold coins? When do you use a bar of gold to buy something? Never. Okay? I mean, go back to a complete collapse of government and anarchy in the streets. You know what happens then? The first type of economy that rises up is a barter-based economy. So when Katrina hits New Orleans and wipes the freaking place off the map because all the levees broke and the whole place is laying down on the floor crying, no one ran around with gold bars buying stuff. But a can of gasoline, some brand new blue jeans, some work gloves, some bullets, you could trade that for anything for about six weeks down there. Right now, you can trade two befores for just about anything in America. Okay? With the price of lumber. Yeah. But nobody's walking around with gold dust in their pockets. This is not the wild, wild west. We have a medium of exchange, primarily electronic, but also these little green paper things with president's faces on them that is our medium of exchange. So this anomaly, this, this weird thing, all gold is safe. Everything goes to gold when all, the, when all hell breaks loose and the world falls apart. No, it doesn't. I mean, you walk through Baghdad after they kill Saddam Hussein, Nobody's walking around the streets there with little gold bars doing stuff. Immediately comes up with the next dictator's face on a piece of paper, and this becomes your currency following a barter, black market barter economy, which is what follows anarchy. So you go from anarchy to stabilization, and there's always a currency that pops up following yeah. in the, with the next government. I mean, when the Civil War broke out, the South, they didn't run around with gold bars. They printed up Southern money, which became worth nothing <laughs> once they were defeated, right? We were defeated. I was here. I wasn't here, but I live here. But <laughs> anyway, but probably wasn't that old. But anyway, but the, uh, you know, I mean, same thing. I got these little pictures of Saddam Hussein on paper money that this guy in special forces brought me back and three bullets from an AR, right? When he was on a thing there. And you know what that paper money's worth? Nothing. Because the people that supported it are worth nothing. 
It's gone. But there was never any gold backing any of it up. But so then why does fear drive it? Because you see, I mean, like the joke is, I feel like on cable news networks, it's always gold commercial, you know, commercials yeah, yeah. selling gold. And that's... It's, it's on this false premise that if everything goes to hell yeah. in a handbasket, then you're, you're going to be okay if you got a gold bar and you're safe. Yeah. Well, that's so much crap, it's unbelievable. It just doesn't work that way. You know, you cannot find a failed economy, consequently a failed government, that has completely collapsed where gold pops up as the standard. It just doesn't. Not in the last 300 years, 500 years. You find me one time in history. You can study it. You can't, you know, Nazi Germany, Hitler takes over. It's on a failed economy, by the way. That's what put Hitler in place. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, they had hyperinflation. Her question was about inflation. Hyperinflation. We'll borrow a load of money to buy a dadgum loaf of bread. So Hitler comes in to save the day. He's going to fix everything with a stimulus check, you know. So, uh, and goes into power. That's what happened. And, and, but they never once went to a gold standard. Never once. There was a lot of black market stuff, a lot of uh, trading back and forth, but never once did they do that. So it's a fear-based thing. And listen, if you get your financial advice on the same channel where they sell walk-in bathtubs and Snuggies, you sh you're, and, and your commercial breaks, or they're selling you financial products, right, with Snuggies and walk-in bathtubs, that should be a clue right there. <laughs> this is The Ramsey Show. This is James Childs, producer of The Ramsey Show. Did you know The Ramsey Show is one of the most popular podcasts in the world? Subscribe or follow today wherever you listen to podcasts. This is The Ramsey Show. You can be intentional about your character. You can have money and a career. You are the hero in your story. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the Dollar Car Rental Studios, it's the Ramsey Show, where debt is dumb, cash is king, and the paid-off home mortgage has taken the place of the BMW as the status symbol of choice. I'm Dave Ramsey, your host. Thank you for joining us, America. It is a free call at 888-825-5225. That's 888-825-5225. Five. You jump in. We'll talk about your life and your money. Renee starts off this hour in Iowa City, Iowa. Hi, Renee. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hi, Dave. Can you hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. What's up? Okay. My husband and I have a small business that is an S corporation. Since we're employees of the corporation, we receive paychecks. Do we, ba um, do we tithe based on the paychecks, our household income, which is our paychecks, or do we tithe on the household income and the profit of the business so we leave the profit or part of the profit into the business? Well, a sub S is all profit is technically taxable. Correct. Passes through. It has no taxes on itself. All the tax, all the taxable income passes through to your personal return. Okay. Right. And so you're going to pay taxes on it, whether you leave it in the business or not. Um, so, uh, what I generally try to do, and this is an exception, but I'll, I generally just say, whatever I'm paying taxes on, that's my tithe. I'm tithing on that. Okay. Okay. Uh, because that helps me if I make a profit on this or I don't make a profit on that or whatever, then if I, if I got to pay taxes on it, it means I made money. And so if I made okay. money, that's an increase according to Deuteronomy and I tithe on an increase. I, I'm not legalistic about it. I just try to overgive. Just try to figure it yeah, out and give a little bit more. So now here's what I do on my business personally. I do not tithe on what I leave in the business as retained earnings because it may become an expense later and won't be real profit. It might be in this calendar year profit, but next year it might be spent to cover payroll during COVID. Correct. So yeah, I do correct. not tithe on it until I take it home, even though that retained earnings account is 100% taxable. 
Okay. So that's the exception to the rule I use of if it's taxable, I tithe on it. I don't tithe on that, and it's taxable. And the rationale is that I leave it in the business. And so, I mean, I may leave $2 million in retained earnings or $5 million in retained earnings in the business this year, and uh, it, might get be, it might be spent on computers next year. And so the net net is I did not have a profit on that item. It was expensed out eventually. It just wasn't in this calendar year. Um, but, you know, it, 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 you, you really can't mess this up because God's not mad about the tithe. Okay. And do you have a time for a quick question? Sure. Okay. My husband and I, our income is um, a little over 150000 We have no debt. We have no home mortgage. Our business is paid for. Um, and we have a million dollars in plus in our retirement. Way to go! Um, we, oh, thank you. Um, but we're looking at a second home, not to replace our first home, but just to have a vacation home. Mm-hmm. And we have $200,000 cash mm-hmm. for this. But the price would unfortunately be around five hundred. Mm-hmm. So we would probably do a mortgage. I wouldn't do it. Okay. A, se- right. a second home is a toy. Yeah. I I, I've got a wonderful lake house, one of my favorite places on the planet. The number of hours I actually get to spend there versus what the thing costs is asinine. It absolutely, it absolutely makes ledge. no sense at all, <laughs> and having a mortgage on it makes it really stupid. It's a big old toy. That's what a second yeah. home is. Okay, great. Thank you, you. You pay cash for toys. You don't buy them otherwise. They're toys. It's just straight up, you've earned it. You've made a good money. You want to have some enjoyment. Papa Dave be throwing some kids off the dock down there, dragging them around behind the boat, trying to drown them all summer. We'll be doing some stuff, right? But all of that is fun, enjoyment, consumption, and all of that is just like it's like going on vacation. You don't go into debt to go on vacation. That's dumber than a rock. People do it all the time, but it's dumber than a rock. And so you just don't buy toys. You know, if you if you got a million dollars and you want to buy a fifty thousand uh, dollar classic car. Well, you've earned it. That's fine. Get your fifty thousand dollar classic car. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not mad at you. You got a million dollars. You got two million dollars. You got ten million dollars. Whatever it is, that's great. Get you a stinking car that sits in the garage for you to go down there and look at it every so often and go, "I got a classic car," because you drive it two days a year, maybe if the battery is charged. Can you tell I know this? And so, and and it's okay. There's nothing wrong with that level of consumption as long as it's a small percentage of your world and you are paying cash for it. Now, if you got $10 million, you buy a $50,000 car, that's like somebody that has $100,000 going and buying a biscuit. So it's not relevant to your life financially, mathematically, so it's okay to do, but always pay in cash and always be a small percentage of your world. Half million dollars out of a million dollar net worth, now your business is probably worth something, your house is probably worth something, you might have a $2 million worth. Half a million dollar vacation home is a bit high. A fourth of your, let's say you got $2 million net worth, a fourth of your net worth in a vacation home, that's a little heavy. That's a little heavy. It wouldn't be that high in a toy. Uh, but, but again, nothing wrong with it. I just The way I judge that is ratios. And can I pay cash? Audrey is in Cincinnati. Hi, Audrey. How are you? I'm fine, Dave. How, how are you doing? Better than I deserve. What's up? It's, well, I have um, uh, pending problem. My brother died in August of last year, and my 92-year-old mom lived with him, so now she lives with me. But my dad had a um, 90-tillable uh, acre farm, and all this needs to be sold. Um, a sporting goods business. The farm has two rental houses on it, and my mother's house is down there, too. There's also acreage up on the mountain that they go hunting on. Who's they? Um, Who's my, they? Um, well, m- my uncle. Uh, it's a, a Garner's farm. Everybody hunts down there. Hunts ta- um, hunts trees, Every, everybody? Deer. Who's everybody? Your family? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So what's your question? Okay. How should I um, orchestrate the sale of the farm? My uncle wants to buy it. 
is there any way that I won't I could reduce taxes if we sell it now? I don't really want to wait till my mom passes away to sell it because I have a lot on my plate. Um, but what would be the best way to handle all this? If you sell it now, your mom's going to pay taxes on it on the sale. If you sell it after she passes, there won't be any taxes. Okay. She's 92. You... Yeah. 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 I mean, it's it could be a lot of taxes. This sounds like an expensive property. I mean, we could be talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars. I would lease it to your uncle uh, with the promise to sell it to him for market value at the time that she passes. You could get professional estate tax advice and double check me on that. What makes our show unique is that we genuinely care about our listeners. We're intentional about choosing the best advertisers to recommend. Blinds.com is no exception. They offer high quality window treatments at unbelievable prices and they make it simple to shop blinds, shades, and interior shutters with easy online ordering, free shipping, and a guaranteed perfect fit. Go to Blinds.com and take advantage of this week's special savings. break audrey called me from cincinnati and uh her mom is 92 her dad has passed and her uncle wants to buy the family farm her mom's moved in with her but the old family farm is mom's old home place audrey wants to clean it all up and get it sold to the uncle before mom passes just to for the lack of hassle and so forth uh, audrey i want to circle back on a couple things and make sure i get better information and then also say it real slowly that you need to meet with an estate planning attorney that knows taxes to keep from being charged out the wazoo here okay now yes and i'll teach you a little bit of why so your mom yes. or your dad inherited the property i assume your dad since your uncle wants to my dad bought the property. He bought the property. From, from when did dad. he buy yeah. the property? Um, back in 1955. Um, yeah. Okay. So what do you think the whole kit and caboodle is worth today? Oh, my gosh. The the farm's valued at uh, 300, over 300000 The store, the sporting goods store is over 100, 129000 um, my parents' house is, um, o- over a hundred thousand. Mm-hmm. And the mountain, the hunting mountain? And in that, that, oh, that, that's probably like 67,000. Okay. So let's call this 600,000 bucks and let's pretend your dad paid almost nothing for it. Cause that's the truth. Yeah. Okay. So mm-hmm. your mom and your dad bought the property together, correct? Correct. Okay. And so your mom is now the owner of the property, correct? Exactly. Yes. So when you buy something for $10,000 or $20,000 or $50,000 and you sell it for six hundred, dollars you pay capital gains tax on the difference uh-huh. of 15%. And so taxes of 15% on this are going to be $100,000. Okay. Okay. If your mom sells it, if I understand Mm -hmm. what you've told me correctly, that's why I want you to get detailed tax advice because it's too much for a radio call. Okay. But the the principle is what they paid for it is called their basis. Yeah. The basis, your cost basis from an accounting perspective. Mm -hmm. And the difference in what you sell it for minus basis is taxable at 15% or capital gains rate. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the problem here. 
Now, yeah. if your mom, not if your mom, we're all going to pass. When your mom passes and you inherit this, or you and your siblings inherit it, your basis becomes market value at the time of death. Oh, okay. That's good. So if market value is 600000 your basis, it's called a stepped-up basis, goes from 30000 or whatever they paid for it in 1955 all the way up to 600000 You turn around and sell it to your uncle for 600000 You have zero gain. Oh, neat. Great. That's why I'm saying we're going to wait until mom mm-hmm. passes unless there's another vehicle to do this or unless I'm not understanding the situation right when you meet with a professional in the estate tax planning world, okay? Okay. Now, okay. now that, that that's why I just said, no, don't do it, wait till mom dies, okay? Because it was taxes on six hundred grand minus whatever little they paid for it in 1955, which almost the whole stinking thing gets taxed. Okay, and that's what I'm trying to avoid. Now, the second thing that okay. runs through my mind is, okay, your mom is 92. Your uncle wants to buy this. How old is your uncle? He's, in a, he's like 85. Why does he want to buy it at 85? Um, he calls it Garner Farm. and the, the, it, uh, He and his like brother his, owned his, it together? His son, no, his dad. Oh, your, 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 farm. Your, your dad bought it from his dad? Uh, well, no. No, my dad bought it, his farm separately, but my uncle has a farm right adjoining, uh, adjoining it. Oh, he's wanting so, to combine this for his kids. Yeah. And keep it yeah. in the family. Yes. Yeah. Okay, that makes and sense. He he, and he wants to keep it in farmland and not let buildings go on. Well, that, yeah, that would be his prerogative right. if he owns it. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. That now, now I understand because otherwise I don't understand why an eighty-five-year-old's all happy to buy from a ninety-two-year-old. <laughs> you know, it doesn't. It, uh, just in general, I mean, for his personal yeah. use, no, but for his legacy, yes. Yeah, I get yeah. it. Okay, that makes sense because they've hunted that property and farmed that property adjacent to each other. Him and his brother, your dad, hung out together. Yeah. Probably had a great memories, great relationships. There's a lot of legacy yeah. tied to this dirt, and that's cool. That's mm-hmm. very cool. Okay, so mm-hmm. uh, again, number one, you're going to see an estate tax planning professional, and you understand why because of the possible tax implications yeah. on six hundred grand, right? And the, right. remember the phrase "stepped up basis." Yeah, because that's okay. what happens on death. Okay, now the last thing. Then, if I'm right, and I think I am, but if I'm right on all those tax implications, what you could do is you could lease the property to your uncle for a dollar a year, let him take over and run everything, him and his boys or kids or whatever, and you don't have to run this farm or the sport goods store or whatever. It's just his. We're going to just lease it to him as if he owns it, and he's going to have the first right of refusal upon your mother's death to buy the whole kit and caboodle in one fell swoop for cash, not financed by you, Okay, we're not getting into all that, but he has the right okay. to buy it at 90% of appraisal. Oh, okay. And you're going to have it appraised when mom dies, and you're going to sell it below appraisal to him. Because if you sold it after she died, you're going to have costs that are going to be 10% or so to get rid of it. Mm-hmm. And you've okay. already, you don't have to go through a realtor. You don't have to go through a bunch of rigmarole. You've got your buyer. Okay. And okay. the only reason we're not selling it to him today is taxes on six hundred grand. I thought that I would have to pay the taxes. No, there is no taxes on inherited Once property. It was inherited. No, because oh, of, because okay. of stepped up basis. That's the beauty okay. of it. And yes. um, okay, that's, and if that's someone just leaves you six hundred thousand dollars cash, you don't have any taxes on that. Inherited money does not have a tax on it by the person getting oh. the inheritance. So um, that's the beauty of it. Now, there might be some probate tax, which is like an inheritance tax at your in your local state. That's possible in Ohio. I don't know what that is uh, or isn't, but, um, but, but you can check on that to be sure. But that's not going to change this number. This number is going to be driven yeah. by the capital gains on 600 grand. That's what's going to blow this up and, and okay. make you, you want to lease it with an option or a first right of refusal. By okay. un- by your uncle and uh, and that kind of a thing, uh, and or his heirs if he predeceases your mom. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, is it, yeah. He's yeah. got his boys Anything or his possible. kids or whatever he wants to yeah. leave it to, right? Right. 
Right. And if they I don't want to, if they don't want to buy it, they don't have to. You can just sell it. But um, uh-huh. at at that time, but uh, that would keep you from having to operate, which is your current hassle factor, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. That's a better answer than going into the break and slamming, slamming you. Going okay. Uh, no, wait till she so, dies. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, what should I do? Because there's two houses on, on the property, and mom's getting rental money about five hundred dollars a month. What should I be doing with that money? I wouldn't um, worry about it. Re- wouldn't worry about it. It's Just not... let it in a bank account. Yeah. Sit yeah, there. Yeah. And if you're going to rent okay. the house, if you're going to rent the property to him, you might not count those in it. You might let her keep getting that rental rental income. Oh. If you're gonna, if you're only, if he's only gonna pay a dollar, you don't want to give him the rental income, right? Well, he's he's already renting the the farm from you. He's, um, yeah. Okay. He pays like a thousand dollars every three months. Oh well, you can just leave all that alone and then just give him a first right of refusal, right? If you yeah. don't mind operating the rentals uh, on her behalf, helping her with it, then that'd be fine. Wow, a lot going on. It's amazing how much effort we have to spend in America to keep the government from taxing something that we've already paid taxes on. That's what they do with the state, by the way. The death tax is they tax your stuff after they already taxed your income that you, before you got to buy the stuff. This is called estate taxes. You evil rich people must be punished. This is The Ramsey Show. of Ramsey Solutions on the debt free stage. Matthew and Candace are with us. Hey guys, how are you? Hi Dave. Hey Dave. Welcome, welcome. Thanks Good to have us. you guys. How are you? Great. Where do y'all live? Columbus, Ohio. Welcome to Nashville. Thank you. And all the way to Nashville to do a debt free scream. How much have you paid off? $171,400. All right. I love it. How long did this take? 13 months. Whoa. And your range of income during that time? Uh, it's pretty much all of 2020, so it was $235,000. Okay, very cool. All right, so what kind of debt was the 171000 Little bit, A little bit of everything. I'm going to read off my sheet here. Okay. Uh, $71,000 of student loans for mm-hmm. undergrad and graduate school. Mm-hmm. $41,000 of credit cards. Uh, $40,000 of a home equity loan that mm-hmm. we uh, paid off when we sold our house, mm-hmm. uh, 11000 of some other personal loans, a 401k loan, mm-hmm. uh, $4,600 of a car loan, wow. 3000 of medical bills. You're just normal. normal. You're yes. just normal. We yes. were. Making really good money and just spending all of it and then some. Wow. Yes. Okay. So tell me the story. What happened? Well, our story goes back longer than... 13 months um, when 18-year-old Matt and 18-year-old Candace started signing promissory notes to go to college, to go to graduate school, and we felt like we had no choice but to do that Mm -hmm. at the time, and that just sent us on a destructive path for Mm -hmm. 20 years, Mm -hmm. and uh, we got to a point about exactly two years ago where we said... We can't live like this anymore, and we have two young girls, Mm -hmm. and I started doing the calculations in my head, and college was coming fast for them, and there was no way we were going to have them go to college, and we were going to still owe all this money, so Uh. we made a huge, drastic change. Um, We sold our house. Mm -hmm. We We moved in. sold all of our furniture. We sold everything that we owned. We sold the kids' toys. Wow. We almost sold them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Wow. And we moved into an apartment, mm-hmm. and we're actually still in our apartment mm-hmm. um, because then the pandemic hit, and we were not expecting that. Yeah. So that was 
a huge adjustment for us. Yeah. And um, we became debt free at the end of 2020 in December. And mm -hmm. we wrote that final check uh, to pay off our largest student loan. And it felt so good. And so uh. it's been a transition ever since then. Um, so what did the house sell for? Uh, about 350000 What'd you um, owe on it? And a 40 home equity loan and what else? Uh, we, we owed about 280 or so. So Plus, after we paid all the fees, we netted roughly 40,000, which the home equity loan was just a loan to pay off other credit cards. It wasn't right. much. It wasn't much. We weren't. Yeah. You just, not, you just got out of the payments. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and you cleared, you cleared the home equity loan in the process. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Okay. Wow. Wow. Very cool. What do y'all do for a living? I'm a social worker for mm -hmm. a managed care organization in Columbus. Mm-hmm. And I actually work in finance for oh, uh, supply chain. Oh, good. Yep. Okay, fun. Good for you guys. All right. So it built up and built up and built up over the decades, literally. And then uh, about two years ago, 18 months ago or so, uh, something happened. I mean, what, 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 I mean, you, you just looked up. I mean, what, what is there? You, you remember the day? You remember yes, what I happened? Do. Yes, Candace I do. Does, yes. It was actually um, my daughter's, my oldest daughter's first communion, and uh, we're Catholic, so she was dressed in her white dress, mm -hmm. her veil, and she just, in the blink of an eye, like grew up right mm -hmm. in front of me, and I think that hit me hard, and mm -hmm. I and I knew we had to make changes for our family. Um, you always talk about changing your family tree, and mm -hmm. that was it for us. We, yeah. we, did, we did it for our girls. We wanted to give them a head start in life, and we didn't want them to end up how we did. And, yeah. But we didn't know any better. So you came home from the communion, and the two of you just sat down and started talking, or what? Uh, uh, yes and no. A few years before that, uh, my friend James bought me the total money makeover and mm -hmm. actually brought it here um, mm -hmm. since before 2014. Mm -hmm. I read it. Hey, these are some pretty good principles. Let's just continue to be normal. I read it again. So I think it was a matter of we didn't think we could do it until we were both in on it and really looking for like this plan that we're on. It's not working. We're running. We're sprinting toward this never ending debt. We turned around and we ran the other way, and uh, we share our story with as many people as we can. Well, not to mention, uh, Dave, when our daughters were in daycare for all of those years, it was impossible to really start your plan and um, to make all those payments. We were upside down and everything. We would stress about which bills we were going to pay and which ones we weren't going to pay, and it was very stressful. So, Yeah, it, it was impossible until you decided it was possible. <laughs> Which it, it, it is. So staying focused, and we didn't have a budget. I can't believe how many people I talk to today, they don't know where their money's coming yeah. or going either. Yeah. So once we print, put that down, and we said, well, we don't need this, don't need this, it became very real that yeah. the goal was attainable during a pandemic year. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. That's so cool. Yeah, it, something happens emotionally that that and it's belief, hope. I believe I can. It's hope. This real. That makes you go, okay, I'm willing to sacrifice now because I wasn't willing to sacrifice if I didn't think it's going to work. Mm -hmm. But something has to go over the line. And, and sometimes it's something that pushes you over the line, like looking at this uh, little baby that all of a sudden is a young woman. And you go, wow, this is going fast. I better get my act together. And uh, sometimes when people have their first child, it's the same thing. They go, whoa, grown-up time now. And you get real serious about it. Something happens that causes you to go, oh, whatever it takes, we're going to do this. My gosh. I mean, my goodness. I'm so proud of y'all. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank not you not so only much. paying off the debt, but we we got the term insurance. We got the Mama Bear legal forms. We got all of our stuff in order during this process, too. And we couldn't wait till until that paperwork was finalized so that we just can breathe a little bit of relief yeah. during that time. It feels good to have your act together. <laughs> it definitely does. We're playing offense and defense, yes. <laughs> That's it's, it. It's wonderful. Yep. Only took this long. It's all right. You yep. got plenty of time left. You're yep. just pups. You got plenty of time. Well done, well done. All right, what do you tell people the key to getting out of debt is? A couple of things. Definitely the budget. We were doing that every single day. The gazelle intensity, the discipline, and the patience. Working as a team, communicating, um, side hustles, all of all of these things combined. Definitely. We're high school sweethearts, so we've been together a long, long time. 
And I think the discipline and patience was the biggest thing um, for us, just sacrificing and just being totally selfless and just, you know, focused, very, very focused. Yeah. Way to go, guys. Way to go. Proud of you. Thank you. All right. And you brought your inspiration with you. What are their names and ages? Oh, yes. This is Greenlee. She's 10 years old. Mm -hmm. And this is Bryn. She's eight years old. Mm Mm-hmm. And All right, beautiful. This is our why. Absolutely. And definitely yeah. makes us cry. So, Absolutely. yes. Absolutely. It's good stuff. That'll make you move mountains right there. Yes. Well done, you guys. Thank you well so done. much. Beautiful family. I'm so proud of y'all. Thank you. Way to go, Thank heroes. You. We got a copy of the Legacy Journey for you because that'll be the next chapter in your story as you move on towards wealth and legacy change, family tree change, and an extra copy of Total Money Makeover to give away. Perfect. And Thank uh, you. Be, able, be able to pay it forward. So good stuff. Thank Proud you. of you guys. All right. Matthew, Candace, Greenlee, Greenlee and Bri- Bryn, Bryn. Bryn yep. are going to do their debt-free scream. $171,000 paid off in 13 months, making two thirty-five. dollars They sold their house. They sold everything. But they're done. Now they get a fresh, clean slate start. Count it down. Let's hear a debt-free scream. Ready? Three, Three, two, two one. one. We're, We're debt free! Yes, 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 yes. This is how it's done. Whoop, whoop. I love it. Woo! There you go, man. Family tree changed. Good, good stuff. This is the Ramsey Show. Scripture of the day, Proverbs 1, 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Conrad Hilton said, success seems to be connected with action. Successful men keep moving. They make mistakes, but they don't quit. Well, I can say I've done all of that. (laughs) Keep moving, make mistakes, don't quit. Done all of the above. Today. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Common sense for your dollars and cents. Tracy's with us in Tacoma. Hi, Tracy. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hi, Dave. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. What's up? Um, my, my, well, my question is, my mom passed away a month ago, I'm and sorry. I'm the executor of her estate. Yeah, thank you. Um, she lived a long, wonderful life. She was 93. Hmm. Anyway, um... I've got, we're going through her will and we're you know, taking care of everything, selling the house, selling the car and everything. My husband and I are already everyday millionaires. We're worth about 2.3, 2.4, maybe somewhere in there. So I'm going to be inheriting probably three hundred dollars to $400,000 from her estate once we've got everything settled. Mm-hmm. So... What? How, how do I go about investing this? I've got sixty six four about in a brokerage firm in mutual funds. Mm-hmm. One hundred twenty five thousand in cash mm-hmm. in a, in a mutual fund, mm-hmm. and then there's going to be another maybe a couple of hundred thousand dollars after we close out the escrow. Uh, the estate account and have the, the household. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, and I also had a kind of a side question of how do we figure out what the value of the house is going to be uh, for tax purposes? It's about three twenty eight. Um, Zillow says it's about four fifty, and we're starting to get the 
realtors coming in to take a peek at it to do the assessment. But yeah, that's that's where you find out the value. There's going to be no taxes on the house yeah. price because of what we call a stepped-up basis. Um, and that is that well, when yeah. someone passes away and you inherit property, your basis in the property becomes the market value, and you're going to sell it within the year of her passing. And so that's going to be assumed to be market value, what you sell it for. You're going to have no taxes on the sale of the house. Yeah, and mom and dad bought the house in 1961. Doesn't matter. For 16000 Yeah, well, that's wonderful. But yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter for tax purposes because your only tax number that matters is you're going to sell it within the year of her passing, so you're not going to have any taxes. And tax value for property tax purposes is not an accurate value, and Zillow is not an accurate value. Zillow's in the ballpark, I, I, and it could be accurate, but you need to get with an with a real estate ELP, the people that we recommend, our endorsed local providers that we recommend for real estate, and have them put a valuation on it and uh, help you get you know get it ready to sell and so forth and figure out what you're going to do there. So then you're going to take all of this money, and you're going to do what with it? Well, um, that's part of my question because we've got – uh, my husband's got a 401k of about 1.35. Yeah, you're million. already set. I mean, I, you got $3 million. So what are you going to do with this 400? Oh, yeah, we're not sure. We're, well, we want to be able to travel on some of it. We want to do a couple of things to update our own our own home. Good. It's, it's full to pay off. But, um, I, I, you know, I, I want to be able to kind of maximize the you know, earnings potential on the money, but I'm not quite you, you, sure. Listen, you, know, how listen. Much you have $3.3 million. You've done it. You've already won the Super Bowl. You're good. Okay. So what I'm going to do with this money, there's only three things you can do with money. You can enjoy it. You can be generous with it, giving it away, and you can invest it. And what I would do right. is just sit down with the yellow pad and you and your husband talk about it and put 400000 at the top of the yellow pad and say, all right, how much are we going to enjoy on a trip and a rehab on our house? How much are we going to invest? And how much are we going to be generous to help someone else get their start? Right. And you, I don't care what number you put on it, on, on those three categories, but break it down into three categories, spending, giving, and spending is enjoying, giving, generosity, and investing. And you can do 90% investing, 5%, 5%. You could do 90% generosity. You could do 90% spending and 5% on the other two. I, you can do 50, third, third, third. I don't care. You get to decide because it's not going to affect your life. You were already set before you got this money. You can't mess this up. Exactly. But that's the very thing that I've been worried about is that, you know, I want to be able to honor the legacy of my mom and dad. Well, I think that if you don't blow it all, that you've honored the legacy. So I think if you invested some of it, they'll be smiling in heaven. I think if you give some of it, they'll be smiling in heaven. And I think if you enjoy some of it, they'll be smiling in heaven. Am I right? Yeah. That's what I would want for my kids, yeah. wouldn't you? Yeah, absolutely, and that's what I want for my own son also. Yeah, so. yeah. So we're modeling that. We're going, hey, when we got mom's money, this is what we did. And by the way, when you get our money, this is what you're going to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that's you know that that's a, just a good, healthy balance. Where people get into toxicity it, with, with inherited money is if it if they don't plan for it and they don't and they leave out one of the categories. I'm not going to spend any of it. Well, you should. I'm not going to give any of it. Well, you should. I'm going to blow it all. I'm not going to invest a dime. Well, you should invest. You know, I mean, this is what people do. And you're not doing any of those, Tracy, because that's how you ended up with $3.3 .3 You're already doing all this stuff. All I'm doing is telling you what you already knew. Joel is in Muscle Shoals, Alabama. Hi, Joe. How are you? I'm doing great, Dave. How are you? Better than I deserve. What's up? Well, first, Dave, I just want to say thank you so much because your message has completely changed my life and my family's life and our business. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. I'm proud of you. How can we help today? Well, um, so I, I, I'm wondering here, 
I have uh, $750,000 in my business savings account. I hate it uh, when that happens. We no... <laughs> well, we have uh, no debt other than our house. Mm-hmm. We have $135,000 on the house. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm just wondering, is it wise to take money out of that business savings account to pay off the house? Yes. Or should... It is. Okay, so I shouldn't hold off and... No, just it's only one hundred thirty-five thousand out of okay. seven fifty. Right, your right. business is not okay. going to skip a beat, and you're going to feel so free. You're going to want to run through the backyard with no shoes on because that grass is going to feel different under your feet. Oh, I, yeah, I can't wait for that feeling. Awesome. Yeah, that's. Uh, I mean, that answers it, David. Uh, exactly what I needed help with. Yeah, I mean, if you want to spend six fifty out of seven fifty, I'd start asking you about cash flow issues at your business. But one thirty-five out of seven fifty, dude, we didn't. You're not even going to notice it's gone. Right, right. Yeah, I, th- I think it's just sometimes it can, I guess, maybe feel selfish or I, I don't know what it, why I'm wrestling with it of, of yeah. just, you know, taking money out of the business, although it, it was your business. really good health. Your yeah, house, your true. business. <laughs> Very true. Yeah, Dave, that helps me out a ton. Thank you. You've done so good, man. I'm so proud of you. You're a millionaire, man. You did it. Touchdown. You own a paid-for business, a paid-for house, and I can tell from the numbers we're dealing with that your net worth is easily over a million dollars. Well done. That's a couple millionaires in a row we talked to here. And none of them talked about inheriting it from their rich mother, did they? Oh, we did talk about an inheritance, but it was 400000 after they already had 3.3, so they were already millionaires. So don't talk to me about millionaires getting inherited money, and that's where it comes from in America. People that say that don't know what the crap they're talking about statistically inaccurate i talk to him every day and more than anybody else in the history of america ever has this is the ramsey show we'll be back with you before you know it in the meantime remember there's ultimately only one way to financial peace and that's to walk daily with the prince of peace christ jesus Have a friend or family member that needs a daily dose of Ramsey advice in their life? Let them know about the Ramsey Call of the Day podcast. It's a quick hit of advice about life and money in under 10 minutes. Check out the Ramsey Call of the Day podcast wherever you listen to podcasts.